she tried to put a lead on it and it sent her to the fucking hospital. I'm gonna have to fucking get in the kennel with this dog, ain't I? Climbing, pulling, poking, prodding. Just because the dog has a strong tolerance for you that does everything doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be as tolerant of the children. How do I stop my dog jumping up? How do I stop my dog pulling a lead? How do I get my dog to come back when I call it? How do I stop my dog reacting? The higher up the mountain I was going, the further the fall. Men don't cry. Men don't talk about their feelings. Depression. What the fuck is that? I, I used to look at the traffic walking past and go, if I stepped in front of this car, would anyone actually fucking miss me? The crap was snatching your soul. Yeah. All I wanted was that because that gave me the best release I've ever had in my life. Uh, she went, I can't do this anymore. You're not the man that I married. How heavy did the habit get? I want to thank you for watching and I want to thank our two sponsors. Grand Alliance clothing brand. They're an up and coming UK fashion brand that are inspired by British history, music and subculture. And Bow Security. They've been leading the way in the industry since 2009, keeping your businesses safe. And thank you for tuning in. Without you and our sponsors, this wouldn't be possible. Now let's get back to the guest. Right, we've got Adam Spivey in the house. Let's go. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. UK's number one dog trainer. Yes. South End Dog Training, taking the internet by storm, winning in life. We try. Smashing your goals. <laughs> helping the masses i think you've got nearly five million followers across all platforms yeah i i think it's uh it's around about four and a half million if you, if you combine them your youtubes your tiktoks your instagrams and everything like that uh i i feel very very privileged uh to be in that position uh to actually be able to use my platform to help people with their dogs wherever they are in the world and also use it to help people with everyday problems that they may be having you certainly earned it it's not it's not falling on your lap because I've seen the graph that you've put in over the years. It's uh, yes, yeah, tremendously impressive and it's inspiring. And I think people are going to be, they're going to be intrigued by this story because this isn't just dogs we're going to discuss. We're going to be discussing Adam Spivey as a, as a human being and what you've been through and the struggles, the highs, the lows that come with it. You know, all of a sudden you just didn't appear on the internet with four and a half million followers and a successful dog training business. You know, you had to fight for that and overcome obstacles, but... I want to ask you firstly what you think about the XL bully ban. I mean, I have been inundated with this. Uh, and again, it's, it's one of those sort of positions that I'm very proud to be in, in a sense that a lot of people look to me to be kind of that voice in the dog training world. And it is something that I take very, very seriously. Uh, but yeah, everybody is just coming out like, what's my opinion on it? What's my opinion on it? And my opinion on it is it's an absolute fucking joke. Like, it's, it's an absolute joke. And the reason it's an absolute joke is because there's already four banned breeds on that Dangerous Dogs Act. Yeah, you've got the Pitbull, you've got the Dogo Argentino, the Japanese Tosa, and the Filler Brazil. I can never pronounce that one. It's like a Brazilian Mastiff. And if you look at the statistics year on year, that's done nothing to reduce dog attacks. It's done nothing to reduce human fatalities. Yeah, they're getting higher each year. So the addition of the XL bullies in hopes to stop what we're seeing in the media isn't going to change anything because it hasn't. So they're, they're looking at it the wrong way. They think that banning the XL bully is going to be a short-term fix, but if we go by history and how history plays, it hasn't done anything. All it's going to do is either end up with a lot of dogs being typed based on the way they look so a lot of innocent dogs and innocent owners that have never done anything wrong they have been responsible they are going to be punished because of some irresponsible dog owners you're going to see dogs that aren't xl bullies but potentially be taken and seized because of the way they look because this doesn't just affect xl bullies this affects mastiff crosses this affects american bulldogs yeah, this affects basically any large bully breed that could be mistaken for an XL bully. And the fact that we already know because of history that this isn't going to help, the fact that we're going down this route absolutely fucking baffles me. What was the what was the incident that happened that encouraged Sunak to put the ban on the XL bullies? I think it was I don't think it was any one incident. I think it was multiple incidents. So obviously 
the media have had a huge part to play in this. And ever since I've Don't entered, always. ever since I entered the fucking dog trading world, like back in 2012, right? Uh, there's always been a dog that the media liked to scapegoat. When I was a kid growing up, it was Staffies. Staffies were the devil dog. You'd mm. always see if there was a dog attack, even if it wasn't a Staffy, they'd seem to have a picture of a Staffy there for their headlines, right? And we've seen it with Rottweilers. We've seen it with Dobermans. We've seen it with German Shepherds. So the media always like to sort of villainize this one dog in a sense and massively blow it up. I think there was an incident that triggered it all the breed hadn't even been revealed. It, the, the headlines read, suspected XL bully attack. Yeah, so the media have a massive part to play in this because all dogs can bite, don't get me wrong, and all dogs can do damage. But if a Labrador was to bite someone, that wouldn't even make the newspaper. If a German short-haired pointer bit somebody, that, that wouldn't even make the paper. But if an XL bully does it, it's fucking mainstream news. You've got film crews, camera crews, everything mm. there. Now, I'm not justifying these attacks by any means. Like, if somebody's lost their life because of a dog, this, this is a serious fucking problem. And there is a serious problem. And even after, uh, even when we go into 2024, there's still going to be a serious fucking problem. Do you think that irresponsible dog owners and irresponsible backyard breeders that have got us to this stage, do you think suddenly they're going to go, oh, I need to muzzle my dog. Oh, I should keep my dog on a lead. Who they fuck? They're, they're, they're still going to be irresponsible dog owners. They're still going to be backyard breeders. So nothing's going to change. The only thing that will change is responsible dog owners will mm. be punished. Because irresponsible dog owners don't give a fuck. They, 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 they don't care. They're not suddenly going to start taking dog ownership seriously. I'd imagine irresponsible dog owners are just irresponsible, period. I'd imagine their kids misbehave as well. I'd imagine they misbehave. Yeah. If you're irresponsible, that's who you are. I think anybody that has a dog that they know if it was off the lead is going to buy it and they're not muzzling that dog, they're not taking safety seriously. If they're letting a dog off the lead that could potentially do damage and they're letting it off the lead, they don't care about what other people... Uh, so the, the, there is a lot of that. Uh, uh, the sad thing is, and it's the same with Staffies, and in case anyone watches thinking that I'm talking ill of these breeds, people need to understand that it's a Staffordshire Bull Terrier that basically got me into dog training. Uh, she's on the front cover of my book, and I'm a huge advocate for bully breeds in general. But a lot of these people that you saw with the XL bullies that are out of control, they're just out of control in general themselves. They don't give a fuck about people. Mm. Yeah, They're just doing what best suits them. The backyard breeders, they don't care about the people. They don't care about where their dogs are going. They just want to make as much profit as they can by breeding dog after dog after dog. So that's where the problem lies. The problem lies with the irresponsible dog owners and until people, until the government wake up, until people wake up and start blaming the other end of the lead, nothing's going to change. We do a podcast in a year's time and we'll be sitting here talking about a different breed, not XL bullies, it'll be a different breed. Yeah, I don't doubt that at all. I mean, it brings me on to, should a, do should a dog owner have rigorous background checks and hold a license to own a dog of any description? Yes. I think, right, so if you look at a lot of things, like, for instance, I, I compare it to a driving licence in a sense because it is a responsibility to get into a car and drive it. Now, I have a driving licence, yeah, which allows me to drive cars. I don't have a licence that allows me to drive a lorry. Now, if I want to drive a lorry, which is obviously a much larger vehicle that requires a much higher level of responsibility, I need to do further testing for that. And then I need a license to prove I can do that. Yeah. Mm. Now, I think this should be the same with dogs. I don't think it should be one dog license. I think there should be stages of dog licenses. I think that before you apply for a dog license, you should have to have a basic knowledge in dog nutrition, a basic knowledge in how to properly exercise a dog, health and safety. Uh, and then you should have a list of dogs that you are allowed to get from set breeders that have been vetted to cut out the fucking backyard breeders. There should be a database of registered reputable breeders, yeah, or registered reputable rescue centers in which you can get a dog from. And the dogs on that list should be something like a Labrador or a golden retriever or a greyhound or a beagle, something like that. Because don't get it twisted. This whole, it's all about how you raise them, isn't 100% true because genetics do play a massive part. Let's be honest, there's a major reason why Border Collies are the best dog at sheep herding. Not Jack Russell's Border Collies, yeah? 
is selective breeding years of selective breeding to get the dog to be able to do that there's a reason no other dog comes close to how fast a greyhound can race again selective breeding there's a reason that the doberman and the rottweiler and the german shepherds make such good guard dogs again selective breeding and with that it does require a much higher level of responsibility to obtain certain dogs so i think you should have your entry level license yeah and then part of that you should have to require some mandatory training six weeks training class just some basic fucking training yeah and then if you say you wanted a rottweiler which is also on the front cover of my first book which is also the logo of our company as well because i had a rottweiler best family dog i could have ever asked my for first right? dog I ever had. yeah i mean they're, they're the... fucking awesome right? yeah they're the ones yeah but again another misunderstood breed mm. yeah but for me, I don't recommend that for, say, a first-time dog owner, particularly one that's not going to get into training straight away because that guard in nature makes them naturally suspicious, makes them quicker to react than a dog that doesn't have that strong guarding instincts. So you should be, uh, you should have to do further testing if you wanted a dog of a higher calibre. Yeah, and you should be judged on your first dog. So if you've got a Labrador, for example, and it's dragging you all over the place and it's out of control... It's an instant no. But if you've proved that you've took dog ownership seriously, that you've trained your first dog to a high level and you've done your further testing, then you should be granted a secondary license that allows you to get a dog of a higher calibre. And there should be strict laws surrounding this. Yeah, the, there should be really strict laws because the, the reality is there was a documentary on BBC iPlayer about uh, people using dogs as weapons. And in it, one of the people say that if I carry a knife and attack somebody with a knife, that's fucking prison time. Mm. Yeah. If I set my dog on someone, get a fucking slap on the wrist. The dog might get taken away and fucking put down, but nothing's going to happen to the fucking person. Mm. Yeah. But if people treated it the same as that, if you've got a dog that's out of control, particularly a large, powerful breed, that's effectively you're walking around with a fucking walking liability at the end of the lead. A loaded gun. Yeah. So if you let that dog off the lead, yeah, or you set that dog on someone, or your dog attacks, maims, or kills, you should be held to the same standard as if you did that with a knife or if you did that with a gun. And that would go a long way into making people take dog training more seriously mm. and dog ownership more seriously. People would think twice before unclipping that lead. 100%. And also, if, if like you say, you, you've got to do staggered licensing, uh, to me, that sounds like a no-brainer. That's got to be the one. And then the, 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 the higher the license you've got, the more responsibility you've got, and the onus then really is on you. You know the consequences. Yeah. If you let that dog off the lead, that's your responsibility. The, the buck stops with you. Yeah, but if we did something like that, mm. right, then what happens is the person that's held, uh, sorry, the being that's held accountable is the human. Mm. You're choosing not to stick to these rules. You're choosing not to follow that. Yeah, you're being dangerous. You're being irresponsible, and you should be held accountable for that. But there is no accountability anymore. Like I said, uh, I think the one of the stories we saw in the newspaper, and you've always got to take these with a pinch of salt anyway because it's the fucking media, right? Mm. But there was a little girl that got attacked, yeah? And the report was the police have spoken to this person. Not arrested him, spoken. Mm. Your dog has attacked a fucking little girl and the police have spoken to you? Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. That person should have been fucking taken away, yeah? If that person had freaking gone at that little girl with a knife, he'd be in fucking prison. That would be equivalent to when you've been arrested. I've got to talk to you about dangerous driving. And there's there's a jail term that's connected to that. Yeah. So until you get the licenses in place for these dog owners, how can you how can you enforce a, a, a reasonable punishment? You've oh. got to get the license in first, surely. Yeah. But even without the licensing, you can still freaking take dog attacks more seriously because I don't think it, it, it's taken seriously enough. Because as I said, all the all the emphasis goes on the breed. Mm. Let's just ban the breed. That'll be that that'll fix the solution. No, it won't. I don't, it's the dog that gets the blame. Oh, your dog looks a certain way. It must be dangerous. Fucking dog's never done anything wrong. A well-bred one that's come from a come from a serious breeder, someone that takes breeding seriously, somebody that breeds for health and temperament, somebody that breeds the dog the way it was originally intended to be. Yeah, I've met countless XL bullies that are fucking lovely, gentle giants, absolute docile, and they're a joy to be around. Mm. Yeah, 
There, are, I'd let my kids play with some of these dogs and things like that because they're just they're just gentle giants. They're goofy, they're stupid, they're entertaining, and they don't have a bad bone in their body. But because the XL Bully is still a relatively new dog, if you compare it to say like a German Shepherd, the German Shepherd's been around fucking since the 1800s. Yeah, uh, if I'm wrong about that, I do apologise. I'm pretty certain it was the 1800s they come in. Or my, I've got 1908 in my head. It's somewhere, but they've been around long enough. They're an established breed. There is a breed standard for them. Yeah, there's. There's a guide that says they sh their temperament should be this way, they should be this size, they should have this sort of breed traits and things like that, selective breeding, yeah? And the XL Bully, it doesn't have any governing standard. So therefore, if you actually look at an XL Bully, you can line three owners up of an XL Bully and all three of them would look completely different. One would be a lot shorter than the other, one would be stockier, one might be taller, because the standard is basically what the breeder is saying it is. Mm. And then obviously the backyard breeding gets involved and you have people going, right, well, he's making lots of money from that. How can I make my XL bully better to sell more than he's selling? So they'll start making it freaking two, three, four different colours. You'll start seeing them that are, are the largest one around or things like that. So all the fault goes on trying to produce a better looking version of the next person that's breeding that dog. And the whole while, temperament is being neglected. And when you have a dog that is that size, that basically no fault has gone into health, no fault has gone into temperament, and it ends up in the wrong hands. Any dog of that size is, is a dangerous dog in the wrong hands. You've also got these dogs that are bred to be dangerous for dog fighting. Yeah. I mean, that's fucking outrageous. Well, I, I mean, I think anybody that can sit there and watch two dogs tear two barrels of fucking shit out of each other shouldn't be allowed in society because that's how well, that's how the fucking story goes. You start by fucking abusing animals and then you fucking move on to fucking people. Become a serial killer. Yeah. Uh, I don't like... The, the animals are fucking... They're helpless, effectively. A dog, the reason it's man's best friend is you take it away from its fucking mum. Yeah, and that dog is solely reliant on you. It's not like a cat. Yeah, a cat's like a teenager. Yeah, it'll come in, it'll purr, it'll ask you to scratch its fucking backside. You'll feed it, and then it'll fuck off all day. And then it'll come back again when it's hungry or crave a little bit of attention. I, I'll compare them to a teenager. A dog is someone that fucking needs you. Dogs weren't put on this earth to be put in a cage to fight another dog for no. money or entertainment. No. But but this is why I do a lot of React videos on, yeah, on, on people that are freaking dressing up with masks on and playing practical jokes on their dog, purposely scaring the shit out of their dogs. I posted a video on my Instagram yesterday. A bloke walks in the house wearing a fucking mask, scares his fucking own dog so much it jumps out the fucking window. Luckily... Well, he done that just to scare his dog? Yeah, just a practical prank because it's, it was going viral on social media. Wanker. People are literally... Dogs are becoming modern-day circus animals, effectively. So we've outlawed in England the use of circus animals. So you don't see lions, you don't see tigers in circus anymore, and quite rightly fucking so, yeah? <laughs> but for some reason, now, for social media and for entertainment... You can purposely scare the fucking shit out of a dog and call that fun. Yeah, people are exploiting their dogs to try to get to get viral videos to make themselves famous and things like that. So dogs are literally becoming a modern day circus animal, and the dog is so fucking reliant on us. Yeah, so when we choose to fucking put it in a ring with another fucking dog, when we choose to fucking abuse this dog, when we choose to overbreed this dog time and time again for profit. Mm. Yeah, when we choose to mistreat animals, it's always the fucking dog that gets the blame, and the human just goes swanningly by. It just it makes no sense uh, to me whatsoever. Uh, but the the reality is, yes, certain breeds in the wrong hands, uh, whether it's through bad breeding and genetics, or whether it's through just fucking mistreatment or lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, certain breeds are more dangerous than others. People will think this is completely airy fairy, but I believe only kind people deserve to own a dog. Yes, I, 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 <laughs> owning a dog is a privilege. We are more connected to dogs than any other animal on the planet, yeah? So I think DNA-wise, we're most closely associated to the chimpanzee, but we have more of a connection to dogs than we do a chimpanzee, yeah? We, like, a dog, for the best part, is if you raise it right and everything, isn't going to fucking turn on you, yeah? A chimpanzee will pull your fucking arms off, <laughs> mm. <laughs> So we have this special, special, special connection with dogs, and I do think people take advantage of that.
Did you know that dogs are actually still viewed as property in the eyes of the law? No. Yeah, so they're, 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 not, they're not classed as a family member or anything like that. So, for example, if somebody like, steals your child, that's kidnapping. Mm. Somebody steals your dog, it's theft of property. Well, I'll tell you something now on that, on that subject when you said that they're not considered a family member. Now, I've lost dogs and I'm sure as hell know you have. I have grieved over the loss of a dog like I am crying over a human being. I mean, it has ripped my, my soul out. Mate, I, I, I find it really hard to steal to this day. I lost the uh, last Christmas, yeah, and I find it so hard to talk about it. I sit there and I think that the journeys that we did together, the travelling all over the country we did together, I think about her last job, the last job that dog ever did, and don't get me, Staffy's going to have a bad reputation. And I, I mean, they're not being hit upon as much now because obviously the media have focused their attention on the XL bullies. Mm. She, uh, this lady contacted us, had this overwhelming fear of dogs, absolutely crippling fear of dogs, and she contacted us and asked if we could help her. And anybody who's got a fear of dogs, I always say, look, contact us and we'll help you. Mm. Yeah, we don't even, if, if there's a child that's scared of dogs, we won't even charge you for that because I think it's a fucking crime to be afraid of a dog. Yeah. Fair play. Uh, and, yeah, so Sammy, my staffy, was in a down, about 30 feet away, nowhere near this lady when she arrived. Lady took one look at this dog that wasn't even moving, wasn't even looking at her, and just burst into tears. Overwhelming fear. By the end of that session, she was stroking Sammy and walking Sammy. Yeah, this dog changed someone's perception mm. on that. A staffy of all dogs as well, that they can often have that bad stigma attached to them. Yeah, that dog was so much more than just. I, I don't, if, if it wasn't for that dog, I don't think I'd be a dog trainer. I don't think South End dog training would exist. Yeah. Uh, and when that dog went, oh, mate, I cried like a fucking baby. Mm. I just fucking weeped. Like, I was lost. I felt like I had a part of me ripped out. Mm. Yeah. And when I lost my Rottweiler, same thing. I, 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 I love my dogs like their family. Yeah, I, I, I think every family should have a dog. Don't get me wrong. I think every family should do some proper bloody research into what dog they get to mm. make sure they get a dog that suits their lifestyle. For example, Dean, my PR manager, who you met earlier, he's got an English bulldog. That is the laziest fucker you've ever met in your life, <laughs> right? That just snores and fucking farts. And uh, he had a car stolen. Yeah, obviously, that's a fucking big problem as well. Car theft. Well, obviously, we're not going to get into that. Not unless you've stolen it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, your dog just probably fucking slept through the whole thing, didn't even fucking realise. So if you mm. had like a German Shepherd or something, you're probably barking his fucking head off. I mean, they're lethal, wouldn't they, German Shepherds? Yeah. Well, the police use them. <laughs> yeah, but, but there's a reason for that. There's a reason they don't go, right... We want to apprehend suspects. Let's get the beagles out. No. Mm. You might use beagles if you want the fucking the passive drug detection dog to go around the airport sniffing out drugs and fucking things like that. You might use them to go and search for someone that's lost. But selective breeding has meant that your German Shepherd is loyal to a T, highly intelligent, very work-driven, but very, very fucking confident and self-assured. So this is why people do need to research it because an English bulldog for Dean is great. An English bulldog for what I need might not necessarily be great for me because it's too fucking lazy, too laid back. Mm. But then there's breeds that I wouldn't own, not because there's anything wrong with them, but because they're too much for what I want to give them for what I need. And this is also another reason why you see so many dogs in rescue because people go, I want a husky because I like the way it looks because it looks a bit wolf-like. Don't realise that that bastard needs fucking ample amount of exercise they don't realize that that dog is bred to be very independent and free thinking so it has no problem buggering off for days on end and going missing that's why recall trading with a husky can be so difficult yeah people just get it because they like the way it looks but there's a question on the on the topic of rescue to rescue or not to rescue me all day rescue but I did, literally did a video on this the other day, right? So there's a saying that goes around, adopt, don't shop, yeah? I hate that saying. I really do because I think that it's manipulative and I think you should take each other, each person 
on an individual basis, right? So I've done the puppy thing. My Rottweiler I had from a puppy. My Terrier, who's at home, who's going blind and deaf. She's 13 years old, but she's still going strong, bless her. She was a rescue. We got her at two years old. Sammy, my staff, was a rescue. Got her around 16 months of age. And I've got now a little fucking Terrier mutt named Myla. And she's also a rescue. She was an accidental rescue. I didn't mean to fucking get her. I just went to donate some food to a local charity and ended up fucking leaving with a dog. Never. <laughs> <laughs> my wife was not the happiest person in the world when I said oh how do you feel about another dog mm. uh, I didn't really uh, pre-warn her I just, how many dogs have you got I've got two now oh okay yeah I've got two that's now that's not too bad no no two, two, two's a nice number mm. yeah but always get your first dog first train that one and then bring in the second dog because then it's so much easier if you've got one dog that's out of control chances are if you add a second dog into the mix both dogs are going to be out of control yeah, it's not going to make life any easier uh, so that adopt don't shop I, I, I don't like that i i say adopt or shop responsibly right because some rescues do make it so fucking hard to get a dog like if your house isn't built like fucking fort knox if you don't have if you work more than four hours a day or you got children of a certain age a lot of rescues can make it damn near impossible for you to be able to adopt a dog and not everybody wants a rescue i do tell people that there is this misconception that a lot of dogs in rescue are troubled dogs or dogs that are dangerous or things like that. That's a misconception. The number one reason why dogs end up in rescue is overbreeding from those backyard breeders. They can't sell their dogs. They just fucking dump them. They end up in rescue. Or people not researching the breed, getting huskies or Belgian Malinois or things like that that do require a higher level of expertise, uh, but they just like the look of the dog when they've seen it on TV. So they decide to get that dog and then realise that that dog is way beyond their expertise and then they surrender it to rescue. So you'll find a lot of gems in rescue. So I think if somebody's on the fence about rescue, don't be put off by it go to rescue but I also tell people to be realistic. There are troubled dogs in rescue, but if you've never owned a dog, don't go and get a dog that has a severely traumatic background and have your hero complex try and fucking save it because if you can't meet the needs of that dog, that dog could likely end up back in rescue. So you have to go in there and be realistic about your limitations. If you're an experienced dog handler, then by all means, go and rescue a dog from a troubled past. But it's about being realistic. But some people do want a puppy and there's nothing wrong with that. That's great advice that is, mate. Yeah. Uh, thank you. But some people do want a puppy, right? And there is nothing wrong with that. Yeah, having a puppy is a joy. Just the same way as rescuing a dog is a joy. I will always rescue from here on out. Yeah, I just... Mainly because puppies, fucking, they're irritating. Well, dogs, <laughs> dog, dog, dogs need men like you. And do you know what? I, I took everything on board you were saying there, and I was thinking about me having the hero complex. I would go and rescue a dog because I wanted to be the hero. I wanted, I wanted, I wanted to be the one that saved yeah. it. When really I should be thinking exactly as you said, am I qualified enough for that dog? Don't try and save it. Am I qualified yeah. to save well, it? This, I mean, the worst thing you can do with a rescue is bring it into your home, keep it there for a couple of weeks, couple of months, however long it is, but then have to surrender it back to the rescue because you'd bit off more than you could chew. That dog has already fucking world has been flipped upside down by being in that rescue in the fucking first place. Because remember, yeah, dogs, they don't on us. Yeah. So when you bring that puppy home and it gets comfortable and things like that, that puppy knows you as its family. So one day, just all of a sudden abandon it. That, that can fuck up a dog. So then go and rescue a dog and then repeat that fucking history again. Mm. It, it's not good. It's, don't get me wrong, taking a dog that is troubled or taking an elderly dog or something like that, right? We need people to do that. But we need people that are equipped to deal with that. And don't get me wrong. I mean, if you've never owned a dog and you want a troubled dog, just make sure you've got a decent trainer lined up that can go with you and can help you. We will go to a rescue center with somebody to help them. We will do the first freaking bring in that dog home session with them if they want. But you either have to have a trainer lined up that you trust that's got a proven track record or things like that uh, to help you along the way or just be realistic because the worst thing you can do for that rescue dog is actually send it back. Mm. So, And that's often what will happen if you go in there and go, I want to save this dog, but you're not equipped to deal with it. If you had to choose one breed of dog, because I know that you'll you, you'll be thinking, well, I'd have that dog if I needed it for oh, that. It's, it's an easy What's your favourite number one dog across the board? Staffordshire Bull Terrier. 
Yeah, it's, it's a dog's dog. It's fucking everything you need in a dog. Mm. It's not so big that it takes up fucking loads of room. It's uh, got a really good life expectancy. It's generally a really healthy, really hardy dog. And it has a natural people friendliness about it. A lot of people don't realise because of obviously some stigma attached to it. But staffies and bully breeds as a general whole were bred to be notoriously people friendly. Yeah. How about that? Uh, yeah, uh, and it goes back to like the old pit fighting days and things like that, like the pit bulls and you put them in. The handlers should be able to touch the dog and remove it. And if that, I don't know how much truth is in this and things like that, but it was believed that if that dog turned around and now the handler, that line was destroyed because you needed a dog that could be basically a farm horse during the day. Yeah, poor, they were nicknamed the poor man's working horse. So you could use them for farms and chores and things like that. But at night, you could exploit them for your fucking dogfight. And apparently it wasn't uncommon to transport a dog that's just been in a dogfight home with a baby and things like that. And it'd be absolutely fine. So people friendliness is something that has been ingrained into these dogs. That's why when you see a staffy that has bit somebody, many times it's not a staffy shibble terrier. Many times it's a staffy cross, yeah, or a bully breed mix, uh, or the person got bit separate in a dog fire because they just threw themselves into the middle and didn't know what they were doing. But they have a, and of course you have to obviously supervise and make sure that you're doing everything correctly. But I find that the Staffordshire Bull Terrier is so fucking child friendly, yeah, so tolerant around children and so tolerant. It's why they're shit guard dogs, they're terrible guard dogs. Which is complete contradiction to their reputation yeah but genetically the biggest issue with staffies is they don't get on with other dogs and they're turned on by excitement a staffy may not necessarily start oh, a fight I see yeah so it might not necessarily start a fight but it's willing to engage yeah, yeah. Uh, when it happens yeah they're turned on by that sort of excitement and things like that their energy and they're sort of drawn towards it and they'll always get the blame even if a dog was to attack them and things like that a staffy might not necessarily start a fight but it's not really going to back down when it's challenged uh but people friendliness, that dog is off the charts. Like, it honestly is really bad guard dog because they're so fucking trusting in people. Let the burglar stroke him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, honestly, I used to have this recurring theme. So I had a Rottweiler, and you never know if a dog's going to protect you until push comes to shove. Mm. Yeah, the only way to actually know if your dog, when push comes to shove, would protect you is to work with a trainer that specialises in that and get in a breed that is selected to do that from a decent breeder that breeds working lines and train that dog to do that job, like the police do, in a sense, with the German Shepherds yeah, and the Belgian Malinois that they use. A lot of training goes into that so they can be deployed on command. Uh but certain dogs are much more likely to bark and to react and just the sight of certain breeds will can make people think twice. But my Rottweiler, she would go absolutely fucking mental if someone knocked on the door. If I said enough, she would stop. Now, I'm not sure what would happen if somebody broke into my home with her. Uh, I'd like to think that she would be the guard dog that uh, that everybody thinks the Rottweiler is. But my staffy, mate, if you walked in with a fucking apple, she'd leave with you. Mm. Yeah, she had a thing about apples. Like, you come in here, have an apple, stroke her. Terrible guard dog. <laughs> she was protective, but being protective and being a guard dog are sort of two different things in a sense. What was the best guard dog in your opinion? And I, I suppose I, I actually better narrow down the question. What's the best guard dog for a home? Because there's going to be a guard dog for a yard, which is going to be like uh, a devil dog. You don't want that in okay. your home, dear. No, but but you you can. Yeah, if you drain it properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the best guard dogs on the planet for me are the flock guarding breeds, your Caucasian Shepherds, your Anatolian Shepherds, your Turkish Kangals. Uh, but these are also high on my list of dogs that you should not be even entertaining getting if you have no experience with dogs. Yeah, so the, we have a Caucasian Shepherd named Clive that comes into our are office. Are they them real big yeah, son of like bitches? Bears. Yeah, they're <laughs> fucking beautiful. And when they bark, it's like, oof, yeah. you can so, feel the wind in your face. So all 65 kilo of Clive, he's on the front cover of my second book. Uh, fucking absolutely gentle Imagine giant. Imagine having here. one of them walking around the kitchen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we have one that walks around our office. But Clive was a rescue. And Clive could have quite easily ended up in the wrong hands. Cool, yeah. yeah. Uh, but these dogs, like, they're, they're second nature. Like, that instinct, uh, they're so suspicious. Like, that dog can go from fucking relaxed to you're in fucking trouble just like that. And it's so big and it's so powerful. And if you don't know what you're doing, it, it, it's just dangerous. In the right hands, 
with somebody that has experience and knows what they're doing. You have Clive. I can introduce Clive to absolutely anyone I want, and he's fine. But if a random stranger decided just to go and introduce himself to Clive that he'd never met and I wasn't present, mm. that could go completely fucking horribly wrong. Yeah. Uh, For anyone that doesn't know what a Caucasian shepherd is, is there images on your Instagram that people can go and actually look or, or, yeah, Google, or Google it? I, I mean, if they want to buy my second book, it's on the front cover of that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, obviously, uh, we've done a couple of videos of Clive uh, that have gone viral, basically educating parents on what to not let their children do with dogs. He's on the front cover of my book. They can Google Caucasian did Shepherd. You, did you bring your book with you? What? No. T uh, just rattle off to the camera the names of both your books. Uh, book one is How to Raise the Perfect Dog, which is all about finding the right breed for you and your family, what to look for in a decent breeder, red flags on what a backyard breeder is, and preparing for that dog and bringing that puppy home. And it covers basically the first year or so of that dog's life through puppyhood, through adolescence. Yeah, uh, it's basically how to take a dog that's a blank canvas and train it to basically be issue free. Book two is how to train your dog, which deals with our everyday bread and butter. So it covers topics like separation anxiety, problems at the vets, covers, it talks more about rescue dogs, uh, talks more about reactivity inside the home and outside the home. So that book was uh, for people that are struggling. So people that maybe didn't buy a book one or people that maybe got a rescue or people that have made some mistakes uh, with the best of intentions and need help with their dog. So book one is basically how to raise your dog. Book two is how to train your dog if it's got issues. So moving into your personal life, before we come back to dogs, because it's yeah. fucking so enjoyable talking about <laughs> dogs. Uh, you've had highs and lows, ups and downs, and you've had some addiction, mental health yep. issues that need, needed to be addressed. And I'm I'm guessing that dogs played a big part in your recovery. But before we come to your recovery, we, we've got to go back to the start where some of these issues that you had began. So in your own words, from wherever you want to start, just roll with it. Okay. So, I mean, I, I've always, always sort of suffered with mental health. So a lot of people don't realise about me because when I go on camera, I'm very brash, very loud and everything. And it's not fake. Like anyone that's ever met me has said that I'm exactly the same on camera as I am in real life. But I'm very good at masking problems in a sense. So if, if, I, if I'm having a bad day... I will never let that affect me talking to somebody uh, in a sense like a fan or I'll never let that stop me helping somebody online or anything like that. I won't let that stop me helping somebody in person with their dog. So I've always been quite good at hiding it. Uh, and this is why I'm very, very thankful to have a platform and be able to talk about some of this stuff because it can really... Because I'm, I'm not alone uh, when it comes to mental health. And when, how old was you when you noticed or you knew there was a mental health problem? Young? Decent childhood? This, this, this is a tough one, right? Because my mum, uh, she, she, she did the best by me that she could. Like She made sure that we didn't go without. I mean, we didn't have money. I mean, I was the person that basically didn't have a brand new fucking rucksack at fucking every year at school or brand new trainers. I didn't have what my friends had and things like that. We did struggle financially, but she always did the best that single, she could. Single mum. Single mum. Tough yeah. job. Uh, and she, she had like some fucking wrong ones in the past. Like she was kind of attracted to like some bad boys and things like that. Uh, say bad boys. They were just fucking assholes. Uh, so I was, I, I was exposed to some, I was exposed to drugs at a very young age. I was exposed to alcohol at a very young age. I was exposed to, some freaking violence and manipulation at a very, very young age. And for a long time, I used to kind of suppress that in a sense, like, no, nah, that's fine. That's what everyone goes through, ain't it? Like, Did the violence like come from your mum's partners? Yeah, uh, it was it was more emotional than anything. Like that, my I remember that, like, for example, my mum would have like my mum lost her mum at a very young age. She would keep a lot of like things that her mum had like ornaments and things and i remember like one time uh one of her boyfriends 
had one and was started smashing them up in front of her and things like that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it, it, a lot of it uh, wasn't so much physical. It was very much emotional uh, manipulation. So I, I, I was exposed to that at a young, young age. And When you say you was exposed to drugs and alcohol, was you exposed or was you consuming? Uh, I first saw at a young age, like my mum would go out on a Friday night with her boyfriend uh, and we would have like uh, a babysitter. Hmm. Uh, but then they'd come back at the early hours in the morning and things like that. And literally we'd be woken up by it uh, because there's a party going on downstairs and you'd go downstairs on the table and there'd be like fucking solid for anybody that's old enough to know what solid is. <laughs> uh, and there would be like some pills on the table, lots of alcohol and things like that. So it was kind of in in my head that, 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 that was normal. And how old were you then? Uh, I was about 11, 12. And then of course, uh, when I started speaking to my friends, the crowd that I was hanging around with, their parents drunk, their parents did this. It, 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 it was kind of normal for me. So I, I, I discovered drugs very very quickly uh when i was younger i think i started smoking weed uh well solid back then uh when i was about 12 13 years old and then moved on to cocaine when i was like 14 uh at the time i didn't actually realize that any of my childhood or anything like that had affected me i just thought this was completely fucking normal uh and i was working at a casino uh before i got into dog training i was dealing poker dealing roulette uh, Would you sniff while you was at work? Well, no. So uh, at this point, I didn't really have well a major drug problem, if you will. Yeah, it this this was still just living for the weekend type of stuff. But I was massively depressed when I was at the casino. I, I was working hours. It was a company that didn't care about its employees. It was just basically a fucking number, and I was barely making ends meet. And, and at what part, what stage in your life was this? Uh, when I was eighteen. Okay, so still quite young. Yeah, uh, I, I was at the casino from about 18 to 23, so for that time, and I was just miserably depressed. And I remember thinking, like, when, like, on the way home from work, I couldn't afford a driving license or anything back then. I didn't actually start driving until quite late. Uh, but I used to look at the traffic walking past and go, if I stepped in front of this car, would anyone actually fucking miss me? Like, I just used to have those dark thoughts. Like, I just felt trapped. I just felt like I couldn't go anywhere. Uh, my life was just stuck in this in this vicious loop, uh, and then and what was the loop? Well, the loop was going to work, fucking working horrible hour night shift, then fucking sleeping most of the day, getting up, going to work on my days off, just fucking going on two day fucking benders like with my mates that worked in the casino, and if I was well enough uh, after those two day benders, go back into work the next day, but. I knew something had to give and it was getting to the stage. I'd, I'd met my now wife back then, right? Uh, and she, uh, we was discussing and she said she always wanted a dog and we was very quickly living together. And I was like, let's get a dog. Now, obviously I have a very addictive personality and I say that is my addictive personality that has its pros and has its cons. Obviously I think without it, we wouldn't have got to where we are now because I'm obsessed with business. I'm obsessed with being the best. I'm obsessed with fucking helping people and just growing and growing. Uh, and that has served me well in business. So we, we, we got a dog. I wanted a staffy because everybody I knew growing up had staffies. Like I, I didn't see what people were saying in the paper about these devil dogs. They had staffies. Uh, so, we, so we got a staffy, but I had a two-year-old daughter at the time and I didn't want her to be in trouble or anything like that with the dog. I wanted a dog that could be my best friend. I wanted a dog that I could take out with me. I wanted a dog that I could take to my friend's house, a dog I could take to the pub, a dog that was safe. So I started learning more about dog training, uh, as much as I could about dog training, right? Uh, I wanted to know about not just staffies, but every fucking breed out there. Yeah. I wanted to know everything there was to know about dogs, not just obedience, but psychology. Right. And I started training this dog and I was doing it all myself. And then I remember I used to take her to the park. Uh, we lived right next to uh, the park at the time. And I used to just draw in this little crowd because I'd do like, just obedience training with a, a me, a ball or a tug toy. And I'd basically ask her to down and I'd walk like the other side of a football pitch. And people used to stop and watch what was going on. And then one day this guy come and approached me and he was like, 
oh my God, where do you take your dog? He said, I've never seen a dog that well behaved. I said, I do it all myself. He said, do you want to train my dog? And I thought he was joking. Mm. Yeah. I'm not a fucking dog trainer. Yeah. Not, not back then. I, I was just training my own dog. So he, he was like, so I was like, because I thought he was joking, I was like, if you want, mate, it's not that fucking difficult. He's like, well, can I take your number? And he had a seven-month-old Labradoodle named Alfie. Uh, so I gave him my number, but I, I never thought I'd hear from him again. So I walked home, and by the time I got home, there was a voicemail on my house phone, uh, and it was this guy. It was going, uh, I met you in the park. You said you'd be interested in training my dog. I'm very serious about doing this. So I turned and looked to my wife, and I said, this dude wants me to train his dog. And she was like, did you say you would? I was like, yeah, but I didn't think he was fucking serious. Right. She said, but you're a man of your word. You got to fucking do it. So I was like, all right then. And I was honest with him. I said, look, mate, I'm not a fucking dog trainer. It's something that I'm considering. And so I went around there and I trained his dog. And the guy was fucking blown away by it. Absolutely fucking specious. It's a Labradoodle named Alfie, black Labradoodle. It just, Jump up, pulling on the lead, typical bray behaviour, very mouthy, bitey, not aggression, but more puppy-fied, if you will. And at the end of it, he said, how much do I owe you? And I was like, you got a fucking clue. I didn't actually realise that there was a huge career off of fucking dog training. Like, I've seen Caesar yeah. Milan on TV, but apart from that, I couldn't name another fucking dog trainer back then. Uh, so I was like, 50 quid. And he got his wallet out and he gave me fucking 50 quid. It's like the best 50 quid I've ever fucking spent, right? So I walked out of that house and in that moment, I'd never felt so much fucking peace. All that fucking shit and all that fucking like grinding away at the fucking casino and everything that was going through my fucking head seemed to just disappear. Yeah. Uh, and that's when I started studying and learning more about dogs and started to pursue that as a career. And I made... Uh, a Facebook page, I made South End Dog Training, and I just basically spammed every fucking dog group in the world. I learned how much people were charging, and I undercut everybody that was fucking uh, prices just to get my foot in the door, because when, when, when you're running a business, you have to be good at what you do, and I, I seem to have like this instinctual knack for it. I seem to be at peace when I was with dogs, in a sense. So I was very... I seem to understand what they wanted, yeah, like almost, it's hard to explain. And people have asked me in the past, like there are some things in dog training you can teach and there's some things that you can't teach. And that's the spiritual side of things, like being completely connected with an animal and how it feels in a sense. Not, you can teach someone to teach a dog to walk properly, teach it to sit, but to truly understand how the dog feels and that energy, and that, that that's quite hard to teach, right? So I undercut everybody uh, that I could in the local area just to get my fucking foot in the door. And of course, I kept getting repeat business because I was helping people with their dogs. I was helping people with aggressive Rottweilers that had been found and stuff like that. Uh, and that was slow building. I was still very much fucking training dogs, going out on a weekend, fucking getting on it. Because again, this is all I know. This is my life. Like a lot of kids might go out and have fucking dinner with their parents or a lot of kids might go out like freaking do all of this stuff. But me was very much... All I knew, the only way to sort of celebrate life was to do fucking drugs in a sense. Ah, okay. So even even though you even though you found love working with dogs, you still didn't ditch the drugs just no, yet. No, no, because I didn't realise I had a problem. I was very much in denial. Yeah. So very much in denial. For me, this is the norm. You go out on a Friday night, like I'm still working, I'm doing something I enjoy now. But on a Friday night, it was still just fucking normal to go out and get fucking paralytic. Yeah. I'd done my hard graft for the week, so I'd go out. Uh, and it the, the, it was slowly building and everything. And then I met my business partner, uh, Evan. What was slowly building, the business or the habit? Uh, both. Both. Unknowingly, the habit, uh, because it would go for just a Friday night. It used to be just a Friday night. Then that Friday night would turn into a Friday and Saturday night. Uh, and then some weeks it would be a Thursday then a Friday and a Saturday. So it was slowly getting more out of hand, right? And then I met my business partner, Evan, uh, who he was the idea behind the online training group. Uh, he was a car salesman and he uh, contacted me uh, because he needed help with his dog. And then he was just asking me, he's like, you got 40,000 followers on Facebook. He's like, how the hell did you do that? And I was like, I just record everything that I do. Like, I just post in the content of the dogs that I'm working with. And he, he offered to build me a website. 
so he built me a website and then we got to talking and long story short, he became my business partner. He's the brains behind the online training group. He's the brains behind our fucking super impressive website that we've got and things like that. He has no real knowledge of dog training, but he was very, very sensible. So he kind of made sure he makes sure that everybody gets fucking paid. He makes sure the taxman gets his money, he makes sure VAT, all that stuff's paid. All the basic, the bollocks that I don't want to have to deal with. So it's great in that sense. Uh, That's a good partnership. Yeah, great, great partnership. We're complete fucking opposites. Like I could say that he's very sensible, very anal and to the fucking T, right? And it's great because I'm more of a wild card. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so it's that yin and the yang and it works very, very well. So I met him uh, just before we kind of went into lockdown, right? So we launched the online training group in December 2018. That's where you can join anywhere in the world and you basically have a dog trainer in your pocket. You can watch our free, tra- uh, you can watch our training tutorials on lead walking, jumping up, puppy buying, or everything you need to know to train a dog is in there. You also get 24 seven advice from a trainer. So you can message one of my trainers anytime you like and get help with your dog. So it's basically like the Netflix of dog training is what we try to create in a sense. So we launched that, but then obviously we went into lockdown and this is where the problem really fucking started. Okay. So we, we, we went into lockdown and I remember being in the start of lockdown. I felt that fucking depression again, creeping in that, 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 that feeling of being fucking trapped Mm. That feel, like that, that, that feeling I had in the casino uh, of being trapped, not being able to fucking go anywhere, like can't see family, can't see friends, uh, just just stuck in, in in that rut. And I remember thinking, I might not make it out of this as a dog trainer. Like when when we started to realise how bad it was going to go, I was like, I might not make this out as a dog trainer. I've got. A, bit of money in my bank but that's going to get us over two months and then being self-employed fucked so would you just between the casino and the dog training you was depressed well suicidal when you was at the casino did those suicidal thoughts subside throughout until lockdown yeah. okay so that so you you was free you was free of yeah of the depression so the, 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 the dogs in a sense saved me they kept you saying yeah because happy. because for the first time ever i felt like i was where i should be so i didn't feel trapped anymore in a sense and i was doing what i love and, and I dogs was, are great for mental health yeah, oh massively they're the, best. Like, the best therapy dogs in the world right and it's that staffy that's that sammy like that's what i mean so much more than just a fucking dog mm. right uh so yeah I, I i remember just going if this carries on like because nobody knew how long lockdown was going to last so i was like if this carries on we might not make it back to fucking being the dog trainer like who knows what's going to happen will people still remember me after this and things like that but anyway i made a fucking tiktok didn't i because i noticed that during lockdown everybody was getting a fucking puppy like everyone and their aunt was getting a puppy mm. and i was like right well i can't post physical videos of me training dogs right because there's no dogs to train let me do videos helping people just with advice. So I started doing like 30 second videos, 45 second videos of how to stop your dog jumping up, how to stop your puppy buying, how to toilet train your dog, how little tips and tricks and things like that. But I was myself, like I was never fake. I was never like, hi, I'm Adam. Welcome to South End Dog Training. Today, we, because people switch off, it's like, right, let's do this. Yeah, and it was no bullshit, straight to the point. And lo and behold, that fucking took off and it fucking almost exploded, like, all, overnight. All of a sudden, we was getting loads of traction, loads of followers, and the online group started growing as a result because, of course, nobody can fucking get a physical dog trainer. So they're watching our TikTok, then they're signing up to our online training group. So we're having an income coming. With that, though, come a lot of hate. Like, it happened so quickly like it went from steadily growing to almost like an overnight success and i was not ready for that mentally i was not ready for that and i felt like i felt trapped again but like mm. the thing that i loved i felt trapped because everyone was watching me i couldn't fucking sneeze without somebody knowing my fucking business did you think it was like people can sense you're depressed as well god like go out and i'd be like wait what 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 if I bump into someone? I've got fucking cocaine up my nose. Like, I'm just fabricating these fucking stories in my head. But I felt trapped. I, I felt like the higher up the mountain I was going, the further the fall. I, I really struggled to cope with it. Now, the downside was I started bringing in more money. 
So my habit started to take over. So it wasn't now just a Thursday and a Friday and the odd Saturday. Now it was, oh, it's Monday night, let's go out. Feels like shit Tuesday, but Wednesday, let's go out. And I could afford to fucking fund this habit. But during lockdown, going out was staying in, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I started I started to sneak out uh, during lockdown in the end, like to go and see a friend of mine. Is that so you uh, could get on the yeah, gear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the thing is the gear used to be a way of just your wind down at the weekend. Right. And then the gear was a way of celebrating. Uh, and then the gear also become my escapism from the real world. I used to think that I had very thick skin, but the, these things do start to get to you when you start to, and of course, because I'm going out doing drugs, I'm feeling like shit. So mentally, I'm in a much weaker state. I, there's some people out there that are desperate to see Southford Dog Trading fail. What if they're successful? What what if what if I go back to have to work in a casino? What what if this happens? Like I don't, my, my my brain can't compute. So the drugs become an escapism. So now I'm doing it when I'm fucking depressed and then quickly realising, well, actually, I didn't realise at the time that I was depressed, yeah, because depression was weakness. So I'm lying to myself, mm. yeah. Depression is a weakness, but in my head at that time, because of my upbringing, because of the way I fall, men don't cry, men don't talk about their feelings. Depression, what the fuck is that, right? But these are all things I'm lying to myself. So I was using it as escapism. If somebody says something bad on the internet, right, as soon as my day was finished at work, I'd go fucking straight out around my mate's house. Yeah. Uh, because I wouldn't look at my phone if that was happening. Yeah. If there was a good day at work, as soon as that had finished, I'd go out. So I was going out Monday night, Wednesday night, Friday, Sunday. Yeah. Sometimes I'd be out all weekend. Oh, so, so these internet <sighs> trolls really affected you badly. I couldn't focus on the positives. So if you go to the comment section, right, and you probably will get your fucking trolls. Everybody that has any sort of following will have trolls, yeah? Any person that's vocal about something, that has an opinion on something, you're going to get somebody that fucking goes against it. But I'd have hundreds of comments of people going, oh, my God, this helped me so much. Oh, my God, uh, I tried this and it changed my dog's fucking life. Thank you so much for this. You're like hundreds and hundreds of fucking positive comments. Like focus on one, one negative comment. I, it would consume me because I'm thinking, what if that person is the one person now that fucking ruins everything? Mm. This is in my head. I was going fucking crazy. And of course, nobody knew this because as soon as I get on camera, I'm professional. I'm me. Yeah, because I'm, for that split second, I'm with dogs. It's about dogs and I can escape just for that split second. Mm. But as I said, because it was happening so quickly and growing so quickly, I, I just felt overwhelmed. During a, a typical session, how long, how many hours we, would you be sniffing for? I, I, I would get there around, uh, I'd never do it at work, right? So depending what time my day finished. So if I finished around, say, 5 p.m., uh, I'd go home, uh, say hello to my wife and kids, and then just fuck off. It's about 6, 7 o'clock I'd get on it, and I'd return home about 6 a.m. the next day. And then work the next day? In the beginning, yes. Fucking hell. Because like I said, when I'm with dogs, I'm just going to this world. But then very quickly, I couldn't sustain it. So I wasn't going into work uh, the next day. If I went out, I wouldn't go into work the next day. I'd sit on the sofa feeling sorry for myself. And that would make the trolls worse in my head. Because I'm like, now I'm not even fucking... I, I felt like I was becoming a ghost in my own company. Mm. And I was stuck in this fucking vicious circle time and time again. And I didn't realise how much it was affecting the people around me. What, uh, what was the typical environment where you were taking all these drugs? Was, was it a kitchen, someone's dingy house? Going to the pub to have a good night was too risky because mm. what if somebody sees me fucking coming out of the toilet or going into the toilet or fucking getting on? So it just stopped. And I'd somehow managed to self-isolate myself again around my friend's house in a flat because that's, that's effectively what I was doing now. I can't go out. It's too risky. Uh, he didn't have any money, uh, so I used to pay for it all. But in return, he would go and get the stuff. He would make the phone calls. I'd never have to see anyone or talk to anyone. So it all come to me. And I had this place where I felt safe, but I didn't realise that I'm fucking secluding myself again from everything. Yeah, no disrespect to your mate. It's, uh, you weren't sniffing gear at the Ritz. You was sniffing gear in a very depressing environment, oh, yeah, making it, it worse. Yeah, massively. Like, uh, honestly. And the, the thing about drugs is it, it becomes an escape. I don't think anybody that goes out on a Friday night thinks they're going to develop a problem. 
Yeah, I don't think when you do your first line of coke or your first fucking pipe or something like, I don't think people are going to think right, this is going to get me. Everybody fucking tells themselves that they can handle it and stuff like that. But when you when you start doing it and that's all you can think about and stuff like that, you got a fucking problem. Mm. Yeah, and the reality is. Those people that are around you, they encourage you to do it and things like that. Then they're, they're not your friends. Like when I mean, when 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 I got myself fucking sober, I remember my uh, therapist, and we'll get into this in a minute. But my therapist said to me about the guy that I'd been friends with for eighteen years, pretty much done drugs with all my life, because uh, I felt this overwhelming sense of loyalty towards the bloke because we'd been together basically for eighteen years. Like we was in a non-sexual relationship, if you will. Yeah, I had my wife and kids, but he was my longest relationship, the person I do drugs and alcohol with and stuff like that. And I remember the therapist saying. Uh, so tell me about a time that you guys have gone out where there was no drugs and alcohol. Mm. I couldn't name one. Mm -hmm. Wasn't one. Wasn't out a wife and kids fucking birthdays. We didn't go out for dinner. We didn't go to the movies. We never played a game of football or anything. Everything was centered around drugs and alcohol. If you remove that from the equation, you're not fucking friends. And that was eye opening for me. Yeah, uh, very real as well, wasn't it? Yeah. How heavy did the habit get? Terrible. Terrible to the point that I lost control. Cocaine was no longer doing it. No, like uh, it was actually more of a hindrance to me because it was just fucking my nose was hurting, my nose was bleeding, and I couldn't enjoy it because I'm like this the whole fucking night, right? Just trying to sort my fucking life out. So we moved on to the light, uh, or crack, if you will. Uh, and this, a lot of people do have this terrible misconception of this. Like they think you're fucking sitting there burning a spoon and fucking things like that. But no, it's just, it's just a simple little weed pipe. You put a little fucking crap eh, and do that. And that was fucking amazing. I was like, it's like a fucking gone to heaven or something like that. That, that really made like everyone just go away. So that was an intense buzz. Yeah. Crack it. <laughs> Oh, God. Tune to the moon. Yeah. And I, a absolutely uh, one of the best fucking feelings in the world. And being an addictive personality, I wanted that feeling every fucking time. Mm. Yeah. Because there's moments where you just like, you just get released. Just a complete sort of fucking release from from everything. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's how bad it got. I started doing drugs that I said I would never, ever touch. I started doing drugs that if you'd done them, if I found out you did that, you're a scumbag, that 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 type of thing. Uh, but it got so bad that, like I said, I'd stop. I wasn't going into work. I was. Uh, I spoke to my business partner about it. He used to dread me coming into work because he never knew what Adam would turn up, whether it be fucking grumpy, miserable Adam or happy-go-lucky Adam. I had stopped being a husband. I had stopped being a father. Uh, and but again, I could see that I was being an arsehole, but you kind of just ride your luck a little bit. I knew there was a huge problem when I would start looking in the mirror in the morning at my reflection, and I used to fucking hate it. And I used to try to convince myself that this is the last time we're going out. This is the last time, mate. Come on, you got to get your shit together. This is all you're thinking about now. This is all, like you, you, this, this isn't a life. Yeah, you're you're in trouble, Adam. You're in trouble. So you was dreading it before you were doing it. It's all I could think about. Mm. I it did. I didn't. I didn't want to do. I didn't want to. It stopped making me wanting to train dogs. I didn't want to train dogs anymore. The one thing that saved me. I didn't want to train anymore. Yeah, I didn't want to be a husband anymore. I didn't want to be a father anymore. The crap was snatching your soul. Yeah, all I wanted was that. Mm. Yeah, because that gave me the best release I've ever had in my life. And how long were you smoking crack for? Uh, I was smoking crack from pretty much the start of lockdown uh, until two years ago. Right, and how often were you smoking it every day? Pretty much every, pretty much every other day. Because uh, I'd have like a day to recover or sometimes I wouldn't even do that. But I would say five, six days a week. I think it's important that the that people watching this understand that I sniffing coke and smoking crack isn't a million miles apart. No, it is in judgment though. Cocaine is almost like a widely accepted thing. Fashionable. Yeah. Like, oh god, we're on a Friday night. Like, let's get a fucking few lines in, a few games of pool. That 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 that's widely accepted. It shouldn't be. Mm. But it is but if you C say... C cocaine and crack are brother and sister. <laughs> yeah. Simple but, as that. But you tell someone you did a crack pipe, instantly they just look at you like you're a fucking scumbag. But also, 
you can't play games with crack. No. You, you have to realise that that is going to get hold of you real quick. Yeah. But again, I was ignorant. I'd done pills in the past. I'd done fucking speed. I'd done MCAT. I'd done fucking MDMA. I'd done fucking cocaine. And in my head, I'm fucking electric. I can dodge all of this. So mm. crack, that's just a new fucking challenge, mate. No challenge, you're going to win. Uh, <laughs> completed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did it. It completed me. Uh, so that, that, that was the problem, right? I knew I needed help, but... Smoking I, so, crack's only for two yeah. years at least. So, yeah, so I, I would wake up in the morning, come on, Adam, you need to get a grip of this. You, you're losing yourself. You're losing your identity. Like, I look like shit. I didn't realise how much it was affecting the people around me, but I, I would be lying to myself in the morning, and then all of a sudden I would... Uh, start to convince myself in the afternoon that, oh, we can do it one last time, Adam. Why not? What's it going to hurt? So at this point, I no longer needed an excuse. It wasn't about the trolls. It wasn't about celebrating. Mm. It wasn't about having a bad day. It wasn't about having a good day. It was just about the drugs. And did, by this stage, was you aware that you was an addict? Yeah, in denial, uh, as a lot of people are before they hit their sort of rock bottom, in a sense. I remember going to a uh, a friend's house. I used to park down the bottom. I'd be in the car and he would come down from his tower block and he'd sit in the passenger seat and he'd say, right, what are we getting? Yeah. Uh, and at that moment, I had a WhatsApp message come through from my wife that basically said that I'm done. Uh, she went, I can't do this anymore. You're not the man that I married anymore. I can't keep explaining to your kids why you're not home at night. You keep telling me this is the last time when it's not. You keep making silly arguments so you can storm out. She said, you're not the man I married. And I knew in that moment, if I didn't go home, it'd be all over. So I went home and just broke down. I went, I need help. And that's when I started to get help. Uh, and I went to NA. Uh, and I went to start to see a therapist. The problem with NA is I kept getting fucking recognised, which made it really fucking awkward. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm going to the place. I feel at rock bottom. I've admitted I'm an addict. And mm. it starts in NA where you fucking sit down and you go, hello, I'm Adam, I'm an addict. That's literally what you do when you fucking sit down in NA, mm. <laughs> right? So now I'm embarrassed. Mm. Let myself down. I've had to admit that I'm an addict. I've had to say it out loud. I've had to admit to my wife that I'm an addict. So did your wife not fully realise the extent? Uh, I think she knew. I don't know if she knew to the extent how much I was doing or what I was doing. Uh, but, she, most, but, but she knew I had a problem. If most people's wives knew their husband was spending 12 grand a month on crack, <laughs> fucking they'd blow their top, wouldn't they? She, she knew I had a problem. A uh, fair play for her for A, sticking around and then B, putting you in that Well, to be fair, it, it's what keeps me on the fucking straight and narrow these days because I don't think I'd get a second chance. No. Yeah, I mean, for, I, I think this is what I think a lot of people don't realise that the first time you do it is an accident, yeah, it, to a degree, yeah, because you, you, you go into it gun ho like, you just, it starts by fucking just doing a fucking lion here or a lion there or a Friday night and then you slowly upgrade or try experimenting with different things to get different buzzes, all your mates are doing it and things like that. Nobody plans to set out to become a fucking drug addict, right? Uh... But once you've gone through that, once you come out and you get fucking sober, to go in and fucking do that again to the people around you, mm. that's when they're less forgiving. Yeah. Did you do the 12-step program? Well, yeah. I went to NA. Uh, I started to go private as well. Uh, I uh, started to go private. I got a lot of therapy. I worked alongside uh, somebody that was an ex-recovering addict that now helps other addicts come out of this it was nice to speak to somebody that had related but i realized that a lot of it uh stemmed from like fucking childhood the exposure to drugs at a young age the exposure to fucking uh watching my mum in unhealthy relationships and fucking being manipulated and just being fucking walked all over so yeah uh, i had to learn a lot about myself the one thing that helped more than anything else was obviously surrounding myself with the right people but also talking yeah, because a lot of people are embarrassed about it. And I was for a long fucking time, like, to, 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 to turn around and say that I was a drug addict, even when I knew I was, just saying that out loud was so fucking haunting because mm. you do feel at the lowest of your low and you become at the lowest of your low. But 
talking is what helped and it's what is what keeps you on a straight and narrow i don't keep things bottled up anymore if i'm having a stressful day i will talk about why i'm stressful days uh, or i'll just write it down on a bit of paper like getting it out into the world i talk about journaling a lot when it comes to dog training but journaling helps people massively uh just just getting it out there putting pen to paper how you feel why you feel like this just a little summary of what's going on and you can use it in dog training as well if you don't know why your dog's reacting you can write down i took my dog out at three o'clock it was cold it was wet there was lots of dogs around or it was around school time my dog reacted three or four times and you'll find over the space of a week or two you might see a pattern it's only when it's school time that my dog's reacting or it's always when I'm rushed where I've had to cut the walk short or something like that. So journaling not only gets it out into the world, but it puts it onto paper so it's not stuck within you. And it's, it's like a contract to yourself as well. Yeah. I regret the people around me that I was an asshole to, that I lied to, that I hurt. Did you have to go back and apologise to all these people as uh, part of your 12 steps? Yeah. Did you do bad things? Oh, not, not really. I was quite a solitary person. I had my friend... Or a few friends, and we just keep ourselves to ourselves. With addiction comes lies, because you've got to lie to su- yeah. sustain a habit. Of yeah, I, I, don't, I, I hurt people around me by, 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 by lying, by being moody, anger outbursts. Uh, the lies, the lies is, is, is like, like I said, I would create arguments with my wife, hmm. because I knew she wouldn't go if I tried to sweet talk and go, Bubs, you wouldn't mind if I popped out tonight, because I knew I'd hmm. worn those ones out. So I used to have to fucking think of a way of sparking an argument mm. so I could fucking leave. So, yeah, that was low. That that was hurtful. Uh, the realisation of... I remember when I started getting when, when I started getting clean and everything and I started putting my kids to bed at night and just, just laying there with them and you realise how many of those simple... Because I'm out getting on it, mm. I'm not putting my fucking kids to bed. I think those little precious moments... I remember going go-karting with my business partner... And he was shocked that I'd never been fucking go-karting. And I was like, he was like, what did you do? I was like, hey, I used to do fucking drugs and alcohol and just fucking have a whale of a time. Well, you thought you was having a whale oh, of a yeah, time. Oh, yeah, I thought I was having a whale yeah. of a time. Yeah, go-karting. Why the fuck would I do that when I can sniff that or fucking smoke that? Like That, that, that seems absurd to me. Uh, but when I went to go karting, it was a humbling, really surreal type of thing. I'm like, this is fun. Right? But yeah, I, I was discovering that little things like going go karting, going out for dinner with a friend, going to some movies, yeah, just just being there with somebody else that outside of fucking drugs and alcohol were things that I had missed, things that I had not allowed myself to experience because my only experiences were drugs and fucking alcohol since those two years i mean i remember the first time like uh when we signed our first book deal yes in those two years we've now released two fucking books in your two years of sobriety yeah in the yeah, two what, years what have you achieved being sober uh we was organically given our blue tick on instagram or blue tick on youtube blue tick on facebook uh our following has pretty much doubled uh the members in our online training group have pretty much doubled uh we've got freaking more staff members than ever before so we're able to help more people i've released two books since being sober i am now doing more public speaking i got to do a public event at wembley in london a public speaking event where i can influence not people not just with their dogs but in life when i mentioned that i'd been sober for two years and i told a similar story to what we're talking about today i had somebody come over to me after that and when oh my God, your speech, I've been sober for three years. It really resonated with me. Then there was another guy come over. He said, I'm coming up to a year being sober. So in those two years, I'm now in a position where I can take my life experiences and I can help other people. I can talk about this because I'm no longer embarrassed by this. Mm. Don't get me wrong. I'll always be slightly embarrassed by some of the things that I fucking did and the people that I hurt. That bit will never truly go. But... I feel like I've been able to make amends for that. I feel like I'm a father. I'll do anything for my kids. I feel like I'm a proper husband. I feel like I'm a proper fucking partner to my business partner. People will never fully know their potential if they're pissed. You you yeah. have you have to go sober to know what you're capable of doing. A hundred percent. It's enabled me to start to see patterns of behaviours that ha- that could easily lead me back to that road and I stay off of it. I'm able to go out now with family and friends when they're drinking, having a good time, and it doesn't fucking bother me. 
Yeah, I've learned I can have a good time having a glass of Coke. Yeah, if all you can think about is getting to the end of the week so you can have a pint or you can have a line, you're in trouble. Mm, it's no life to lead, man. I, I, I was naive. I used to look forward to the Friday. Yeah, Friday night, going out with lads. Great fun. It's faux happiness, isn't it? It's yeah, not real. It's not. Do you, do you want to know what my Friday consists of? Tell me. I, I look forward. My wife enjoys rugby. Me and my wife both enjoy rugby. Perfect. Uh, I look forward to coming home. I look forward to fucking spending time with my wife and kids. That is the highlight of my day, getting to go home to my wife, sober, where I can be fucking honest, honest with myself, honest with her, uh, and just fucking enjoy it being in that moment enjoy being a father enjoy being a kid has sobriety rekindled the lust between you and your massively, wife massively massively i'll tell you why i asked that question and it's a personal question yeah. but what a lot of people do when they're sniffing gear is they get their phone out they sit in a dark room they put porn on and they wank themselves silly <laughs> that they sit there tugging on a limp dick but that then affects their love life at home and that falls by the wayside yeah. and they end so up in a whole load of shit there wasn't, Not that I'm suggesting so. you was wanking, Lynn, <laughs> but it kills the romance at home, doesn't it? I, 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 I only cared about myself. That, that unfortunately, that's what happens when you become an addict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, you get stuck, and everything is about getting that fix. Yeah, so yeah, I was an absent now. Like we we go on holiday now. We never used to go on holiday. We we go on holiday now. Even if it's just a fucking caravan holiday, we just we just go on holiday yeah uh we do more family things like tonight we're going out bowling with the kids taking the kids bowling my first day night is going bowling yeah uh i want to be at home whereas before i didn't i didn't all i wanted to do was be in that dingy little flat and just get off me fucking trolley you've learned to love yourself mate didn't you? yeah absolutely fucking uh and, and like i said it's, it's made me a better person in life and this is as i said we circle back to the fact that Obviously, everything snowballed really, really fast, but we have got four and a half million followers. Uh, so it's important to me to tell this story to somebody because there'll be some people like, oh, you get trolls, right? But there'll also be somebody listening that will go, do you know what? I'm on my way there or I'm there right now. Mm -hmm. So if I can use my platform to help somebody fucking struggling, that's what I'm going to do. It's also changed my mindset on trolls completely. Yeah. I love them. Yeah. Fuck them. Yeah. Part of helping me stay fucking positive and things like that is focusing on those that need the fucking help and not wasting a breath or time and effort on people that have nothing better to do than to try and tear you down. A big, big reason for the success, I can never say that word, success of South End Dog Training is because we don't get involved with it. Yeah, people, like, if somebody makes a video about us and we, uh, like, I'm, I'm notified. As soon as somebody says something bad, that that's a, it's a blessing and a curse because I have very loyal followers, right? Uh, and they will tell me uh, if somebody said something. They're like, have you seen what so-and-so said? All right? And if I'm doing it and ask me anything, I'm like, yes, I've seen it. And I don't care. Can I make a video slanging someone off or I can make a video telling someone how to stop their dog buying them? Make a video how to stop your dog jumping up, how to stop your dog fucking rushing out the front door. Yeah, I can react to a video of a child in danger saying why we shouldn't do this. Or I can do a fucking react video as to why it's so fucking bad to scare the shit out of your dog. Yeah, I can use my platform to talk about addiction, to talk about mental health. So somebody listening that might think there's no help out there can get help. Yeah, it's, it's, it's real nice where you put in your energy. You spoke about how you can stop your dog from biting you. Now, I was bit by a dog when I was real young, maybe six or seven. Stupidly, there weren't people like you on the internet warning me what not to do, but I had my face in this little Yorkshire Terrier's face and it's gone bam and it's done my lip, <laughs> blood everywhere. But that gave me a phobia of dogs yeah. for, for years as well. I mean, so what's the, to, to avoid getting bit by a dog outside of putting your face in theirs, what else do you avoid? Okay, so, People need to understand, right, that their dog and a strange dog are two fucking different things because people will often approach strange dogs the way they approach their dog. So you see it, like, they will get straight down to a dog that they don't know's level, yeah? Don't crouch down to the level of a dog you don't know, yeah? Because if you crouch down, a lot of people say, I even see trainers recommend crouching down to the dog's level because it looks 
less threatening. But if that dog panics or reacts, it's going to get you straight in the face. Don't hold your hand out for the dog to sniff. That's one that I don't know where this one started. Everyone does that, don't they? Everyone. But I don't know why. Because maybe it's just because they haven't encountered it, mate. But if you do that, like my late Staffy or even my, like any of my dogs, if you do that, they'll be absolutely fine with I'd it. I'd do it. Why do yeah. I do that? Well, because it seems to be, I don't, it seems to be fucking drummed into people to do that. It's almost like I, I come in peace. Yeah. We have a happy go lucky dog. Like I said, you come in my house and do it to my dog, they wouldn't give a fuck. Yeah. But when you're dealing with nervous dog day in, day out, reactive dogs day in, day out, right? Many times they are so suspicious. So their eyes seem to work more than their nose. So they just see something they don't recognize and that makes them uneasy. They start to tense up and they start to get concerned. So that act of holding your hand out for a dog to sniff very much looks like you're reaching in to touch them. So you can make a nervous dog back away or worse, snap. Yeah. So the dog's nose is so fucking powerful. Yeah. If you're encountering a dog, if it comes over to you, just keep your hands, fold your arms like this or keep your hands down by your side and let the dog sniff you. A lot of the reasons why people get bit by strange dogs is because they don't let the dog sniff them. Yeah. The way a dog says hello is by sniffing. Right. Yeah. And you have to let the dog sniff you and you do not interact with that dog until it's finished sniffing you. Ah. Yeah. So. And then is it safe to put your hand out? It depends on the individual dog. If it walks away after sniffing you, it's just not at that end to you. But now you know. Hmm. Now you know. If it sits next to you or starts nudging you or pouring you, there's a high possibility that it wants a little bit of attention from you or if it presents its backside. But because we interrupt the dog before it's finished sniffing us, we don't get to see how the dog really feels about us. And we just reach in and assume the dog's going to be okay. And that's when people, that's when accidents happen. I do that all the time. If I'm, if I'm walking my dog or if I'm walking down, let's say an old railway track jogging and, and a dog comes running to me, I greet it by squatting down and embracing it. So that's a big no-no. The, the, the thing is, right, dogs will generally bite if they bite. They'll generally bite the closest thing in front of them. So if you hold your hand out, what's likely to get bit is your hand, if that dog is going to bite you, right? If you crouch down to their dog's level and it bites you, what's likely to get bit is your face. People need to avoid putting their face next to strange dogs. Mm. Not necessarily talking about your dog. You might fucking be able to hug your dog, kiss your dog, fucking rough up your dog. Right? In a playful manner, by the way. Like, just, like, I, I, I like to, I used to love to rough play with my staff. Like, my French, but I used to have a dog to Bordeaux. We'd yeah. done exactly that. I mean, we would rough each other yeah. up. I think it's very much a guy thing. Like, my wife doesn't do it, and my kids don't do it. They play with the dog nicely, but I like to just get in there. I'll go on all fours and I'll mm. push into the dog and think, I could do that. But if a complete fucking stranger did that, it's not going to end the same. Yeah. But we seem to know this with individuals. We take each individual on face value, yeah? But you don't go straight in and start hugging every fucking person you meet. It's going to end badly. Mm. You don't go running up to every single person you meet. It's going to end badly, yeah? But there's a couple of very basic rules. When a dog, when you first meet a dog, let it sniff you, let it finish sniffing you, and then you can see how it feels. If you've got an excitable dog, a happy-go-lucky dog, for example, and you start talking to it before it's finished sniffing you, often you can start making it jump up and getting a little bit fucking silly because now its ears are taken over and those words are creating excitement instead of doing a nice calming sniffing ritual. And if you start talking or interacting with a dog that's nervous before it's had a chance to think sniffing as shaking hands yeah so if if you interrupt it before it's had a chance to finish that then you can destroy the trust in that dog you can make it back away you can make it more nervous you can fucking make it snap at you or worse bite it yeah so always do that don't put your face in the face of a dog that you don't know don't hug a dog that you don't know go underneath not over the top yeah, because that's quite a threatening act. It's quite normal to want to stroke a dog on top of the head. Mm. Your dog you might be absolutely fine with, yeah. But a strange dog, that, you often get that. So do you reckon go under the chin? Underneath, yeah. Be best end is the fucking farty end. So a All lot right. of dogs, you ever notice that a dog likes to show you its backside? Mm. Safest place to stroke a dog is its backside. <laughs> but underneath, yeah, that 
gets that that back away motion whereas that it looks like we're fucking holding a pair of balls but that cupping uh, yeah <laughs> think cupping <laughs> but that makes the head come up yeah and you could just, just just do it with your dog later on, right? Stroke him on top of the head and then stroke him underneath and watch the position of his head and mm. where it goes. I had a client one time, right? And she kept hugging her dog and her dog would start mouthing her and jumping all over her. She didn't realise that the dog was doing those behaviours to get her to stop. She thought her dog loved the hug. Mm. But no, the dog had learned that if I start mouthing you when you do that, you stop hugging me because then they walk away because I'm being silly. The dog wasn't misbehaving or getting excited because of the hug, because it was infatuated with it. It had learned this behavior gets me out of this fucking behavior. And I I recorded it and I showed her. I said, and I put it in slow motion when she hugged the dog. I said, look at this. I said, can you see your dog trying to pull away? She said, I never noticed that. Oh, she fucking would have noticed it if it uh, switched on her. He's I've, never done that before. Yeah, I've, yes, famous last words. I've I've often seen videos on the internet. I mean, pet videos go wild, don't they? Cats, dogs, people love that. They'll share them all over the shop. And I've seen too many videos where great big dog is laying on its back or its side and there's a little kid with the parents just, I mean, we're talking like, three, four, five years of age, literally mauling and rolling all over the dog and no one's pulling the kid away. Yeah. And I'm thinking... If that dog switches, that child is dead. This is why we do a lot of react videos to videos of viral trends in a sense. So people scaring the shit out of their dogs or kids fucking climbing all over a dog. Or To kids. me, that seems nuts. It's red flags, right? But I do these react videos not to belittle the person that's done it. I do it to educate the public as to why you shouldn't do this, yeah? I'm not saying that you're fucking... Uh, shouldn't have a child or shouldn't have a dog, unless they actually fucking don't deserve one because they're purposely scared the shit out of the dog or hurting the dog. But mm. when it comes to, like, the child and parent things, I have golden rules, yeah? When a dog is eating, the child should not be fucking interacting with the dog, yeah? Shouldn't be stroking a dog, shouldn't be sticking a hand in the bowl. You like to eat without being fucking climbed all over. Let the fucking dog do it. Mm. And But here's what people hear when I say this. My dog's fine with me being touched. I'm like, I didn't see you. I said fucking children. Mm. Yeah? Because that's also what people don't remember uh, realise, is the dog that lives in a family will have different tolerance levels for each individual person within that family based on how much they interact with that dog, based on positive experiences with that person, based on security with that person. So children can easily lower that threshold that dog has by climbing, pulling, poking, prodding. Yeah? Just because the dog has a strong tolerance for you that does everything doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be as tolerant of the children. That's interesting. So if you've got a family of five, three kids, yeah. and the most irritating child is the one that keeps prodding the dog and the dog bites him two or three times, just, just little nips, yeah. down the line, the same child is going to be more inclined to get bit because it, the dog's used to biting that child. Yeah, and the thing is... It's more likely to happen a second time, particularly if nothing changes, because the dog learned in that moment, holy fuck, should have done that straight away. Would yeah. have, you would have fucked right off. So the dog learns in that moment that biting makes you fuck off. Yeah. But also when a dog bites, it's almost like it feels like it has no other fucking option. Mm. It's been ignored. It, if you look at a lot of these videos of babies or toddlers climbing over dogs and just stop, ignore the baby for a second, but look at the dog. His attention is always on the owner who is likely the one holding that camera. Yeah, it's not looking at the camera like, is this a good angle? Yeah, yeah. It's looking at you like, help me. And then the dog in that moment knows that you didn't. And then this keeps happening. Mm. And then the dog turns and snaps and the owner's like, oh, I don't know where that come from. So this is why I do react uh, to a lot of those videos. But golden rules, if, you, if you've got fucking parents watching, yeah? And I'm talking about children. I'm not talking about you and what you do with your dog. If you want to be fucking stupid and get bit by your dog, that's a different fucking story. I'm talking about protecting fucking children, mm -hmm. yeah? So when a dog is eating, leave it the fuck alone. When a dog is asleep, don't let the children go over to it and bother it. If it's in its crate or if it's in its bed, or even if it's on the sofa, don't have them go over. Teach children not to stick their face and hug dogs, not put their face in the face of a dog. Yeah. These are simple things, but most bites will occur when a dog is asleep or when a dog is eating. Yeah. 
or when a child is climbing all over the dog or has its face in the face of a dog. So we can avoid these. And you can teach your children, depending on what age, if the child's a toddler and doesn't quite understand it's not meant to be climbing all over the dog, your job is to remove the fucking toddler from the situation. Yeah, Your job is to provide a safe spot, like a crate that your dog can go to if it wants to retreat from all of this stress. As that toddler starts to get bigger, you can introduce responsibilities, like you can take it out for a walk. You can put a nice long lead on the dog, so put the dog in a harness, for example, have a long lead attached to the harness that the child can hold. You have a slightly shorter lead attached to a collar, so the child feels like it's walking the dog, but you're in complete control no matter what happens, but the child's now involved. You can get the child involved in teaching the dog little basic tricks like sit or like paw, or have the child involved with actually being the one that puts the dinner bowl down and then walks away from it so that... There's the things you can do. You can include the dog and child together on activities. So there's so much times throughout the day where a child and dog can interact with people, safe uh, each other safely. You can take a few minutes when they're eating or when they're asleep to be that time that you leave them the fuck alone. Mm. Everybody needs that little bit of fucking peace. And as a cautionary tale, what's the, what's the the scariest encounter you've had with a dog? I got called to this rescue centre. So a lot of rescues will reach out to us. So they were always happy to fucking work for rescues. And a lot of the time we don't even fucking charge them. Yeah, it's my way of giving back. This rescue had taken on this emergency dog that needed a home. Uh, but this was quite a small little rescue. And all the dogs she tries to incorporate have been in the house. And they kind of roam free. Uh, but she couldn't get this dog in the house. Because as soon as it had a lead on it it would just turn into almost like a wild horse bucking up. And uh, she tried to put a lead on it and it sent her to the fucking hospital. As soon as that lead went round it, it just went fucking mental and sent her to hospital. So she contacted us, right? So the dog was in an outside kennel and this dog's fucking terrified, right? But my job is to get this dog comfortable on a lead and integrate him into the house with the rest of the dogs. He's in the corner. He's not coming out. He won't come to me for love, no money. I'm sitting down. I'm ignoring him. I'm dropping food. I even bought another dog out because he was friendly with dogs to see if the, see if my own dog could entice him out of the kennel that he was in. But he was just fucking basically hiding in the corner. Yeah. So I'm like, right, I'm going to have to fucking get in the kennel with this dog, ain't I? And I'm going to have to put a fucking lead on this dog that's hospitalised somebody <laughs> while I'm in this fucking kennel. And they always say when an animal's backed into a corner, that's when it's at its most fucking dangerous. And the most scariest moment probably was when I got in there, it was deadly silent because I do a lot of dog training in silent, just try to get connected with the dog. Shut that door. And I'll tell you what, the latch that fucking locks you in so loud... <laughs> and we got him out, we got him in the home, uh, uh, got him in the house, and uh, now he's living in the home. He's doing fucking fantastic. Uh, or there was another moment when I went to work with this uh, Mastiff mix named Cassie, uh, and she was about fucking 65 kilos. She was a beast, right? And she was reactive to people. So I've come in the house and I've ignored the dog. Yeah, last thing this dog needs is me to intrude on it. Yeah, it's already nervous and suspicious. I've seen it straight away, so I've ignored the dog. I've got in, I've sat down with a client. She's made me a cup of coffee, right? And the dog's come over to me and it stuck its face right in my face like that. And I always tell you as a dog trainer, the worst thing you can do is panic. Now, it's very hard when you've got a mastiff who you can feel his breath on your neck investigating you and you're like, don't panic, don't panic. <laughs> Think happy thoughts because I didn't want to show fear to this dog because that would make the dog more uncomfortable. Hmm. So yeah, that, that's quite a funny moment. But the dog sniffed me and what I tell and what I preach, just let the dog sniff you. Don't hmm. interact with it. Don't look at it. Act as if it's not there. Carry on having your conversation with the owner. Cassie sniffed me and walked away. Uh, I worked with Cassie, uh, got her over a fear of people. Uh, and yeah, she was, she was a fantastic dog. For someone who loves dogs like you do, when you still see countries like China and South Korea that actually eat dogs and sell off bits of dog meat like you'd get in a butcher's, I mean, what do you feel about that? Uh, I mean, I'm not ignorant to some of like that's why we see a lot of romanian and eastern european dogs over here because of the treatment of them uh i've heard that in spain once uh their racing dogs are no good they break their legs so they can't ever be used again i don't know how much truth is in that because again i've not actually been there to see it firsthand 
Uh, I know some countries treat a lot of dogs way better than others. Uh, they seem to be very good in Turkey. They seem to look after a lot of the stray dogs in Turkey, which I was quite surprised when I went there. Obviously, England and America love fucking dogs like they're fucking humans. But at the end of the day, I try to stay in my lane always, yeah. Uh, I can't go over to Korea and stop that. I can't go over to Spain and stop that. We've got enough dogs in the rescue centres over here, enough dogs over here that need fucking help, enough dogs over here that are struggling. So I just fucking focus on as many as I can in the area that I'm at. Right, before we wrap this up, let me just fire some, some short, sharp questions at you. What's the most commonly asked question you get? The most commonly asked questions I get is how do I stop? How do I correct? So it could be anything from how do I stop my dog jumping up? How do I stop my dog pulling a lead? How do I get my dog to come back when I call it? How do I stop my dog reacting? Now, the reason I'm framing it like this is because this is actually quite important. People's first engagement with me is often how do I stop? How do I correct? And they're looking at the wrong thing. Many times they want to stop a behavior, but the dog doesn't know what it should be doing instead. If your dog isn't coming back when you call it and you keep letting off the lead, it's not going to come back when you call it. Have you thought about maybe putting your dog on a long line and holding that long line and going to different places? And if the dog ignores you, really the in so the dog knows there's no, opportun uh, no opportunity to ignore you. Your dog jumping up, it jumps up because you stroke it or go, hello. How are you doing? Have you taught your dog that if it sits there nicely, that gets it the attention, but as soon as it jumps up, you remove your attention from the dog. So a lot of people want to stop the dog misbehaving, but the dog's only behaving a certain way because you haven't took the time to show the dog what it should do instead. Yeah. So that's how I try to reshape people's thoughts about it. If your dog's going mental at the doorbell, have you taught your dog that the doorbell could mean go to your bed and here's a nice juicy bone or here's a handful of treats? So a lot of dogs are problematic because owners haven't taught what they want them to do in the first place. Dog theft. Yes. What's uh, good advice for preventing your dog getting stolen? Uh, don't let it off the lady's got no fucking recall. Don't let it run over to dogs that you don't know. Uh, the, the reality is, basic safety is if your dog runs over to someone and you can't stop it, you also can't stop that person grabbing your dog and fucking off with your dog. I don't stop and let strangers interact with my dogs i just keep moving i do the old phone trick or have headphones in like if if i see somebody eyeing up my dog or something i'm like hello and just keep fucking walking like just go at a fast pace head down like on my phone uh i tend not to talk to too many strangers when i'm outside uh with my dog because it's mine and my t i don't like things interfering with mine and my times uh with the dog because Life is short. They only get those few hours a day to go out, in a sense. And I want to make sure that I give them all of my attention, not fucking waste time talking to freaking somebody else when I'm outside. Uh, I feel like that's very important to dedicate your time to the dog. Uh, and, of course, if if dog thefts are rife in your area, go somewhere where there's a lot of public. Yeah, and don't be afraid to scream like at the top of your voice. Yeah, stranger danger. So yeah. in uh, in Wales dog fighting is well on the rise so what would you say to people of wales that are slinging their dogs in cages to fight other uh, other dogs throw yourself off a cliff yeah you're the lowest form of scum did you did you know that in, that in wales the stats for dog fighting are just off the charts no i didn't uh if i'm being 100 percent honest mm. with you I, well I, I was only researching this yesterday because i know that you're yeah. going to be here today and i just couldn't believe that just the rising dog fighting in wales like why well, the thing is, obviously, since the dawn of time, animal exploitation, uh, that's what we're seeing. So you, you got people that want to fight dogs. you got people that want to fucking use dogs for their own amusement. you got people that want to uh, basically breed from dog after dog after dog after dog because people have learned very quickly that you can use dogs to make money. And this is also why we're seeing a trend on social media of people doing dumb shit with dogs, mm. scaring them, fucking... Uh, messing with them when they're asleep. Like, I saw one fucking guy pour Dr. Pepper on his fucking dog's testicles for the sake of a fucking viral video. You got one person who tricked his dog, the dog, who, let's bear in mind, is very much of the mindset of a three-year-old, right? Went to his water bowl, somebody poured a fizzy drink in it. The dog's reaction, and they're fucking laughing their head off. That dog fucking trusts that the water comes from that bowl, yeah? And these videos are going viral. And the thing is, people will do anything these days to get a viral video but again it's becoming at the exploitation of fucking animals or people people purposely winding up people in society purposely fucking with people in society 
because we've gone to such a fucking PC world where people have fucking got no fear of doing anything. Uh, they're not worried about me punching the mouth anymore. Yeah, I mean, someone that's pouring fizzy drinks over their dog's bollocks could do with a punch in the mouth. That's, uh, hey, that, 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 that's animal abuse. That, that, that's not a light prank. That's fucking animal abuse. It's also it's odd behaviour. Yeah. Now, there's, yeah. a, there's, there's a Penn State professor that's recently been arrested for performing a sexual act on his dog in public. 64-year-old professor, and he he was arrested. I mean, it was the, all the evidence was there, and he said it helps him let off steam. So in China, you've got fucking, they, they cook and eat dogs, and over in the States, they're making love to them. That person should be taken and sectioned and assessed whether or not he's actually deemed to be allowed out in fucking society. I think we, again, if we kind of move to a world where we've become so inclusive that we accept absolutely anything now, and being normal is slightly fucking odd mm. in a sense. But somebody that's fucking an animal has mental health issues, and that needs to be treated seriously. That 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 person does need to be locked up <laughs> and needs some help. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. Like all this, all this shit, the boundaries that are getting pushed further and further afield, and we're having to accept all this nonsense. Like, yeah, bestiality is where the line has to be drawn. No. Have you ever heard of a woman called Carol Bowditch? She's a pensioner from Lincolnshire. She's been found guilty of sleeping with three different breeds of dog, all recorded. Where are you getting your facts? <laughs> I've done my, I've done my, I've done my research. But well, they were hosting, so, so they were hosting parties, fucks. hosting parties, and then other couples would come round, and then then they'd all join in. And her defence was she didn't didn't know that sleeping with animals was illegal. She didn't know. So for the record, anyone watching this, like, it's very much illegal, and it's fucking ill behaviour. Oh, ill behaviour is a fucking understatement. I mean, it is it's quite possible that she didn't know it was fucking illegal, but you should know that there is something not fucking <laughs> right here. <laughs> Ill illegal or not, it's... Uh, do you know where I put it, right? It's taking advantage of a minor. That's that's what category I'd put it in, mm. right? Because a dog doesn't have the same brain cognitive development as an adult. They have the same similar brain cognitive development as a toddler. Yeah, when you like I said, if we go back to that dog, when you when that bloke that poured fucking fizzy fucking water into the dog's bowl as a prank on his dog, that dog has no idea why that happened. When you put a fucking mask on, knocking on your own front door and scaring the shit out of your dog to the point it jumps out the window, it doesn't know what practical jokes are, yeah? Your dog is the sort of animal that if you had a ball and there was a fucking truck coming and you threw its ball into the road and it had it was off the lead, 99% of the time, unless it was taught otherwise, it's going to chase after that ball, run straight in front of that truck. Doesn't know to stop for a second because that truck's going to fucking run it over. Dogs, domestic dogs, are so fucking dependent on us. A lot of them wouldn't even survive in the wild anymore, Yeah. They still have some hunting instincts, don't get me wrong, but a lot of them are so codependent on humans, yeah? So I would put bestiality in a very similar category than fucking with somebody that is not in the profound mindset to understand what is going on. You are taking advantage of somebody that's vulnerable. Hmm. And a couple of light-hearted questions to round it. Oh, to good. Round it, to round <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, so when I'm doing my piece, I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. you're, you're UK's number one dog trainer. So I've got I've got to be looking into questions, all things dogs. And when I stumbled across them two articles, the professor yeah. and, that, and that pensioner, I'm thinking, fucking hell, is this really going on out there? There's definitely some fucking mental health issues there. Mm, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, no, that, that shit doesn't surprise me. It's just I try to stay out of bestiality for dogs. Yeah, I like <laughs> to, I mean, although it's... It's not my business nor my concern, but I do like just to reinforce a few things out there to people that, no, no, that, that, keep, that keep thinking that the boundaries can be pushed and, and that more and more things are acceptable. That is not. Yeah, I, I think half the problem is in trying to be completely inclusive for absolutely everyone and let everyone and their fucking art express who they want to be, we have taken it too far. Mm. Yeah, we, 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 we really have. We, we live in a state where opinions outweigh facts and everybody's so worried about fucking offending someone or hurting someone's feelings that we've just got a bit fucking batshit crazy. Mm. 
good words to remember those as well. So the light, the light-hearted ones. A couple of light-hearted questions, and then uh, and then we're done. Hooch from Turner yeah. and Hooch, Lassie or Scooby Doo? Who would you choose? Hooch all day long, uh, because French Mastiffs are fucking awesome. Mm. Uh, they tick a lot of what I look for in a dog. Uh, I like the protective side. I like the energy level of a Mastiff. Not too lazy, not too overbearing, too high energy. Uh, they make very f- loyal family dogs, uh, and they're, they're beautiful to look at. Their life expectancy is not very long, is it? No, six to eight years on average. Uh, mm. And that, To be fair, before I went down the route of a Rottweiler, uh, I was kind of... Uh, looking at a Mastiff because I love Mastiffs and I do worry about Mastiffs with obviously the XL Bully Band coming in uh, how many of them are going to be fucking sucked into this mm. uh, by looking a certain way in a sense I think the French Mastiffs will probably be alright because it's distinctive yeah you like, Turner and Hooch is a famous fucking dog it's a dog to board though like walking down the street you can tell that's a dog to board though but I think like crosses of this that could be mistaken for an XL bully they're the ones that are going to be in a lot of fucking trouble so yeah I hope this doesn't spill over and affect too many Mastiffs and things like that because like I said the Mastiffs are fantastic dogs yes I mean that just there'll be so many broken hearts yeah uh Again, it, 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 it's it, it's wrong. It's wrong on so many levels. If we go back to the teaching our children in schools and things like that, to be more open-minded, to be more accepted of people, different cultures and for what they are and stuff like that, yet we are going to a world where we go, look, judge a dog by the way it looks. You tell your child in one breath, never judge a book by its cover, and then you tell them it's fine when it comes to dogs. Mm. When it comes to dogs, because it looks that way, it must be a dangerous dog. That's bullshit. Yeah. Final question then. If you were a dog, oh, fuck. What... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you were a dog, what breed would you be and why? Probably, I think probably the reason I like Rottweilers is because I can relate to them a lot. I, I am very loyal to those around me that I consider close, my wife, my kids, and close, close friends, uh, sometimes a little bit too loyal, if you will. I'm very suspicious of people I don't know and quick to react if somebody I care about is friend. So, yeah, probably a Rottweiler. It's slightly misunderstood. A lot of people like me, but a lot of people don't like me because I swear too much or they think I'm too brash or too loud or whatever rich reason. Uh, so yeah, Rottweiler, misunderstood, but loyal and protective to those that matter. And the future, what does it hold for you? Uh, I want to do more of this, if I'm honest. Like I said, we get invited to a lot of podcasts and we do say no to a lot of them. And I want to do more spreading the message, spreading the message about addiction, spreading the message about mental health, spreading the message uh, about helping yourself in order to help those around you. I want people to know that they're not alone out there, that there are people that have gone through it and got out the other side. So if you're sitting there thinking there's no light at the end of the tunnel, I'm living fucking proof there is and there's other people out there. It can get better and it will get better uh, and never be afraid to ask for help. So I want to do more like this. I want to do more public speaking. I want to do more podcasts. I want to uh, collaborate with more people that have been through similar stuff that I'm going through. And I just want to continue to spread my message, helping people so they in turn are a better person so they can help their dog. Well, all those things you've listed that you want to achieve after spending a few hours with you today, I sincerely believe that you are born for it. And I wish you all the best and thank you for coming on. Thank you so much. Cheers, brother. It's been an absolute pleasure. Cheers, mate.